Today, what we're going to be talking about is um, some of the common errors and useful tips in writing. And these are whether you're writing in broadcast form or print form. We're going to talk about the style rule for sports reporting for writing it for both print and broadcast. And then we'll talk about some of the tips, some of the numbers, rules, things like that that we have to apply, that we have to keep up on. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these errors and, and tips and things. Uh, I laid them out here on Blackboard for you so you can take a peek at them. But a couple of things to think about, uh, the one sentence paragraph. In print, we write shorter paragraphs. In, in your composition classes, how long, how many sentences should be in a paragraph? Three, three to five. You have three to five sentences in a paragraph. Why? <laughs> because I told you to. There's a reason in any. You've got to build the idea, right? Because each paragraph is a new thought, a new idea, correct? In print format, paragraphs are usually one sentence to two sentences. Because when you think about whenever you go into columns in a newspaper or a magazine, they shrink down, one sentence will be four or five lines. Well, if you do three, four sentences to a paragraph, you're going to have one big, long paragraph. That gets really cumbersome, really hard to follow. We can use a one sentence paragraph to provide some punch. Okay, because a shorter sentence, a shorter paragraph provides a little more punch. But you don't want to get in a habit of every paragraph is one sentence. You want to mix it up a little bit. So make sure that you'll have a one sentence paragraph, then you'll have a couple of sentences, and then you might have a quote, okay? And quotes get their own paragraph. Every time you have a quote, it's its own paragraph. All right? On um, the excessive example, you do not want to beat a dead horse. If a team played poorly, say they played poorly, and let's move on. We don't need to have how badly they played in three or four or five lines. Talk about it, get on with it. Blind attribution, make sure you're, you're citing who made the quote. If you have a quote, tell us who made that quote. Okay. Excessive, adju My keyboard right there. Excessive adjective and adverb usage, that requires more space, more time, and it's more words. In print format, we are limited by how much space we have for a story. So if your editor gets you 15 inches, you have 15 inches. So you need to be thinking, where can I cut so I can get the most important information in there? I need to give some great quotes. I need to give some great descriptive. I need to maybe give some stats. I need to say what's coming up next. If you have excessive use of adjectives and adverbs, that's taking up room. So don't do that, all right? You can use more active verbs to state it. Uh, I said up here, he shot a sizzling 62% from three-point range. Well, anybody who knows sports knows that 62% from three-point range is sizzling. There's no point in saying it was sizzling. You can just say he shot 62% and let your reader go, wow, that was pretty stinking good, and leave it at that. Okay. Uh, the Q&A format, one thing you need to think about as reporters is, what is your job? To report or to inform, not to ask questions, to answer them. So if you get into a big excessive Q&A format, you're not answering those questions. It works nicely for a column. If you're going to do a column or you have a standing feature that goes in your publication, like Sports Illustrated has a uh, weekly feature where it's, um, you read Sports Illustrated, right? Is it Keith Olbermann? I don't remember. It's, <laughs> Dan Patrick, thank you. I totally blanked on that. Dan Patrick does a Q&A format in every one. It works nicely for that as a standing one, as a standing feature. But if you're doing a, a story, you do not want to get into the Q&A, and you don't want to ask a lot of questions. Avoid the cliches. Just any more need to be said. You know cliches in sports. Get away from those. Unfathomable numbers. In journalism as a whole, we say try to avoid numbers because they're hard to follow. Well, we're writing sports. We have to use numbers. But don't give them in excess. Don't give too big of numbers. If somebody signed a contract worth $15,487,362 over five years, signed a $15.5 million contract, period, over five years. Okay. Um, some quick and dirty style and grammar tips. Number one, you always give the winning score first. This is the number one error I hear out of young reporters. 
Winning score goes first. I don't care if you work for the UCM media network and you're covering the mules and the mules lose by a score of six to 10. They lost 10 to six. You've made it clear that the mules lost. And by reading the score, we know what, how many runs the mules scored. Because that's what students want to do or young reporters want to do is we'll have to give our home team score first so people know how many points they scored. No, you said they lost. And anybody who knows anything about sports knows 10 to six. The sixth lost. Okay. Uh, schools and or city names are its mascots are there. This is the second most common error out here. People want to say the Kansas City Royals have won their third straight game, or the Kansas City has won their third straight game. There's only one Kansas City. Okay. Kansas City won its third straight game. The Royals or the Kansas City Royals won their third straight game. Okay. Um, visiting team in the box score is always listed first and on a scoreboard graphic when you see the graphic the visiting team is always first except in soccer soccer does it reverse do not ask me why I've been searching and searching I can't figure out why I think it may be just because it's an international thing but the visiting team is always listed first that's why when you think about in baseball and softball the visiting team bats in the top half of the inning the visiting team bats in the bottom half of the inning Okay. Pay attention to your verbiage. Baseball and softball, it's a 2-2 two -two count, or the count is 2-2. Two and two. I've really heard a lot more of this since we started doing more with broadcasting. So pay attention to that verbiage. Um, a .333 batting average is a batting 333, if you're reading that out loud. Not 33.3 or 33.3%. Okay, He's batting 333. All right, same thing, quarterback uh, who's completed 22 of 35 passes was 22 for 35, not 22 and 35. Okay, so think about the verbiage, think about the usage. And of course, since it's sports, know your number rules. In print, we always use numbers for 10 and up. Okay, 10 and above, unless it's something like a contract worth 2,500,000, then it's 2.5 million. But in print, 10 and above, we always use the numbers. Okay, in broadcast, we go 12 through 999, and then we use combinations. Why in broadcast will we start at 12 instead of at 10 like we do in print? Think about, as if you're a news anchor, you're on the desk and you're reading it. It's coming through a teleprompter. Why would we use, why would we not start with the number 11? Why would we not write the number 11? Because it could look like two I's or two L's and it could be confusing. So instead of saying, okay, we're going to print out 0 through 9, write the number 10, spell out 11, print out 12 through, we just go from 12 to 999 is numbers. 0 through 11 we spell out. Okay. On um, in broadcast, we you or what else I say in there? Oh, in print, check the style book for which numbers you're going to use and when, what times you're going to spell it out. For example, um, it's fourth down, spelled out fourth, but the ball is on the four yard line. We use the number. Okay, that's why your style book comes in handy. Broadcast is much easier. We're just spelling it out. Period. Okay, print. You need to know when to use which one. When you spell it out, you use the number. Okay. Those are some quick, dirty little tips. If you want to print that off and keep it handy with you so you can go back and refer to that, it's really useful. Okay, so keep that in mind. Let me do this real quick, get all these open right here. Okay. watching on the video last week I took pictures of all the slides and posted them up on the video I'm not going to do that anymore because that took me forever and delayed you getting the video um, you have the PowerPoints on blackboard you can see as it's moving on the screen so you can just move it with it that way okay
paper. So we, okay. All right, some quick tips on coverage. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. That, uh, that probably said a quote from this. <laughs> <laughs> questions that you need to ask that will help you get started. Okay, after you've got, done your interviews, after you've been to the event, after you've taken your notes, ask yourself these questions before you ever start your story. How many of you, before you write, will do like an outline? Just kind of a layout for yourself to kind of give you an idea of what direction you want to go. I kind of get like a mental outline. Get a mental outline? Michael, do you write anything down? Yeah, like for each paragraph, the idea. Okay. Okay. How many of you have a hard time starting, but once you get into it, you're fine? Do any of you start it and then come back and write your, your intro paragraph or your lead? I usually, I usually can start with my lead and get into it. I usually have an idea what I want my lead to be by the football game in the third quarter or halfway through the second half or what have you in a basketball game or whatever. But when I can't, I'll write the story and then I'll come back and throw the lead in. It's sometimes starting is the hardest part. All right, and you just come back in and fill that in. But if you ask yourselves these questions, what's the best quote I have? What's the best description? Uh, what did I see when I was covering this, covering the story, covering the game? We always seem to want to write about who won the game, who is the, who had the best stats, those types of things. In football, what did the quarterback do? What did the running back do? In basketball, who was the leading scorer? But there are times when the defense was fantastic. Yeah, you may have had a, a guy score 45 points in a basketball game, but the defense held the other team 20 points below its average. So you have to figure out, okay, what's the best story here? All right, on the defensive side, it was the team. On the offensive side, this guy did that. So you have to think about what was the top part, all right? In general, the complete story, no matter what sport, should contain the final score early in the story. This is Now, this is print. Okay, think about this. This is print. Early in the story, what was the final score? Who played? That's kind of critical. I did a news release when I was at Dickinson State up in North Dakota covering our football game. Submitted it, sent it out. Everybody got it. My president it was a small school. The president of the university used to edit my news releases. That was the most nerve-wracking thing in the world. It was my first job. It actually made me a better writer, but I hated it at the time. He came and he goes, read this story. So I'm reading it. Okay. He goes, what's wrong with it? And I went, nothing. He said, who played? And I said, well, we played Jamestown. He goes, how do you know? I said, it says right here. He said, no, it says we played Jamestown. It doesn't say who we were. I never put that Dickinson State played Jamestown. I just took it, it's in the byline, it's on the cover page, it's, you know, it's everywhere else, but I didn't actually write it in the lead. I didn't write it anywhere in the story. Make sure you get both teams involved there. When and where the game was played, uh, key players out of same place. These are some of the things you need to be thinking about. In any story you write, are you going to include all this? One that gets left out a lot, effect on game or league standings. Now, early in the season, is that going to be critical? Why not? It's the start of the season. It could have an impact if, say, Central Missouri is playing Pittsburgh State, two teams that are usually really good in the conference. Whoever wins that game gets an early lead, gets an early leg up, but it doesn't have to be, so make sure that it fits, all right? But later in the season, that's certainly going to be a big key. Record set during the game. One pet peeve of all seasoned reporters. Is there such a thing as a new record? Yeah. Why not? If it's a record, it's already been, been done. I've set a record. It's by very nature a new record. It's redundant. You just say set a record. Obviously, it's new. Okay? So don't say new record. Just say set a record. Also, we hear a lot of times a personal record. Individuals don't have records. It's a personal best. Okay. Um, 
Games are long, so keep good notes. How many of you have actually gone out and covered a sporting event to this point? How often do you take notes? How often do you start right, working on your story? I'm not very slow. I was in high school when I started, like, the past season, you started pretty much on this track. Okay, so, like, covering a football game, did you write it at halftime? Did you write it into each quarter? What did you do? I went over my notes at the end of each quarter. Kind of do a summary after that quarter? Yeah, that's helpful. If you try and absorb everything during the game, that's tough. Because there may have been a key play early in the game that set the tone. All right? You may have had some great special teams play early in the game where the kicking team pinned the other team deep in its own territory. So you may have scored, you kick off, you pin them on their one. Defense kind of came out, did a good job, stopped them, they punted. You got the ball back at the 50, we're able to go right in the score again. You're up 14 nothing, just like that. Okay? But if you wait till the end of the game, you might forget that one. Make sure when you're taking those notes that you do note plays like that. The guy who slides into second base and breaks up a double play. So instead of being three outs, there's two outs, and then the team scored four runs in the end with two outs. That's a key play that doesn't show up in the box score, but you want to be able to refer back to that. So you've got to take notes always as you're going through. Um, yeah. Covering professional or college sports, you're going to have a PR staff that's going to give you stats. And with those stats, there will be a play-by-play -play that you can go through. Very, very helpful. But still keep your own notes because then you'll know where to go look for those types of things. Okay? There's nothing more frustrating than going, I know there was a big rally in the third set where we came down back from five down and we took a 6-0 lead. But where was it? And you have to start sifting through the whole play-by-play -play to try and find that. That can be very frustrating. Still, this is a, a handy little tool to have. So like if you're doing broadcast, if you're filming, if you're a one-man band and you have to film the game and write notes and get the highlights, what you can do is you're filming, you get a big play, go to the scoreboard. Now you know what the score was after that play happened. Okay, then you can come back down. So then when you refer back to the play-by-play, -play, you know, okay, the score, it was the third set, this was the score, this is what happened. I go to the play-by-play, -play, boom, I've got it. Okay? You learn some of these tips and these tricks as you go along. So keep track of those types of things. In high school and in summer leagues, you're not going to have that luxury. You're going to have to figure out how to do your own notes. The stats, the example I gave you the other day for football, that worked really well for me. Baseball, we'll talk whenever we cover baseball and softball how to keep a scorebook if you've never kept one before. I have my own way of doing it that's different from other people, but the basic rules are generally the same, but that's going to help you note how to keep track of it. Okay. Um, if you're covering high school, you have to keep your own stats. Again, make your own system, whatever is going to work. Keeping play-by-play, -play, I don't know that I would necessarily worry about that, because if you're trying to keep track of stats and play-by-play, -play, you're going to miss something, especially if you're doing broadcast format. Okay. So go ahead and just come up with a shorthand. Um, and just be able to keep those notes, or keep the stats, and just jot your notes as you go along, all right? Do go to some practices so you get an idea of what kind of style they play, who the key players are going to be, uh, who runs the ball more, who they throw the ball to more, who the best defensive players are. So you kind of key on those guys and keep track of them. You have to develop rapport with coaches. You have to. We talk about this a lot in just general news reporting, like if you're covering fires or police, and that's your beat. The worst time to go introduce yourself to the fire chief is when? During a fire. During a fire. The worst time to go meet the head volleyball coach or the head track coach? At a track meet, at a volleyball match. Get out there and introduce yourself to them early. You're going to get to know them a little better. You're going to get to know what kind of things that they want to talk about, what kind of questions they're going to answer, and which ones they're not. Because okay? once you're covering the event, you're under deadline. You don't have time to, to fiddle fart around. You've got to get the job done. Okay, so build that rapport. Be fair, be honest, and always, 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 always double check. Double check spelling. Double check pronunciations. <laughs> double check grammar. Double check stats. All of those things will add up to help you have a better story, will help you develop credibility. Because remember, you're reporters. You have to have the trust of your audience. Okay. If you can, take record. 
If you can record the interviews, do so. Because then if they say, I never said that, well, actually, yeah, you can play that. Okay. But, uh, she might have got a, 10 years ago, it was right after high school, for the USCW Democrat, um, a part time uh, sports writer. Uh, the Warrensburg High School had a uh, big, um, was a uh, hazing that the uh, head coach ended up with my, it was, uh, it was a uh, big deal. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, Covered that today um, at the uh, same conference, uh, rivalry. So today so was uh, interested. Uh, at the time that the story printed, uh, the lawyers had advised him not to talk to us. Uh, before that, I had called them and I, mean, I had to turn in all my notebooks, all my recordings, all my records that we um, we were uh, we were going to get sued. Because uh, really, but well, they uh, they threatened a lot. It ended up getting dropped because they looked at the dates and said, "Okay, well, uh, he uh, he wasn't allowed to say that at the time that you actually talked to him. You ran the story a week after." I don't see where that would matter. If he talked, they don't, there's no law That's, against uh, you reporting what he said. His uh, his no concern. When he said it. His concern was at the time of. Uh, Sedalia does say uh, they were doing a uh, preseason for all of the uh, area football schools. Mm -hmm. uh, what he called uh, and said was that uh, I used information from the uh, preseason made inferences when he actually named names about people that were suspended and mm -hmm. um, who was getting, who were going to miss games and stuff like that. He said at the time that that story ran, he never said those names, that I just went back to a previous story that I had done and pulled names from which would have been, in his mind, uh, inappropriate. But I was able to uh, turn over all of my uh, notes and recordings when I got to send names. Yeah. Them. So I got to uh, I got to walk out and I didn't have to go to court. It was great. And that's you know that's something to keep in mind. You guys are trained in law. You guys are being trained in media law and what you can and what you can report and how you can report it. He may have thought it was inappropriate and not like it, so wanted to sue you. That's not a lawsuit offense. I mean, you didn't do anything wrong. He may have said, well, I told you that in this interview for this story. You can't use it in this one. Well, if you told me players who weren't going to be able to play for this story, and now we're doing a preseason story, you told me who's not going to be able to play. I so. uh, can't remember exactly. It was for the first time I actually dealt with the uh, editors that were above uh, my boss and whatnot, but it was, uh, I can't remember exactly. I mean, it was uh, one of I don't remember exactly all the nuances of it, but yeah. they were, uh, I suddenly got to meet uh, everybody that I worked for. And, and, was, and, uh, and let's keep in mind, I mean, you guys have watched movies from, I mean, you've probably seen The Natural, okay? From an older time, way back in the heyday of baseball and sports journalism and things, and you saw the contentious relationship between professional sports and the media then, probably even more so now. Okay. They don't like us very much sometimes because we are the ones who have to report when they break rules or when they do something stupid or when they're out of line. That's our job to report it. That goes further to why you need to develop rapport. You need to develop a relationship. Let them know, look, I'm not out to get you. I'm out to report what's happened. I'm out to tell the story of what's going on. I always get mad when people say, well, the dang media's going to report on it. You know what? I don't have to report on it if you don't break the rules. If you don't do something wrong, I don't have to write the story. But that's why you need to know your law. That's why you need to develop that report. Keeping the tape recording secondary is to protect yourself if somebody tries to come back later and say, I didn't say something. Number one is so you can be accurate, because that's our number one goal as reporters, to be accurate, to be fair. Okay. Um, often when you're covering sports, you're going to have the opportunity to get quotes in a press conference. That's great. In, in college and in professional sports, they do have news conferences. After every game, there'll be two different places. Professional sports, they'll always have somebody from their PR staff go down and they'll transcribe those quotes to make sure you get everything for reporters who can't be there so they have access to those quotes. Some colleges do that. High school, that's not going to happen. All right. 
but you're going to have that time for a news conference. Now, after the news conference, if you want to get further into it and you want to talk to that coach or that player, you can try. But generally, when they do a news conference, after the news conference is done, that's it. They're finished. If you didn't get your question answered then, I have this time for you. They're going to come out. They're going to make an opening statement about the game, about the event, and then they're going to give you a chance to ask questions. You can take the responses to other people's questions. So if Morgan has a question, she doesn't get to answer it, but Matthew asks a good question and she likes that question and likes the response, it's perfectly acceptable for Morgan to use that response, okay? But listen to the other reporter's questions because if Matthew asks a question and then Morgan comes back and asks the same question in a little different way, good chance that that player or that coach is gonna say, I already answered that, all right? If the coach or player will not directly answer his question it is perfectly acceptable to rephrase the question and ask it again and try and get him to answer it, all right? I have always been of the opinion there are no dumb questions during a news conference. They may seem dumb because everybody knows what you should have done in that situation. Super Bowl two years ago, they try and run Marshawn Lynch up, the, or they try and make a quick slant pass right at the goal line when Marshawn Lynch had been just grinding out yardage, they should have handed the ball off, he should have scored, okay? Everybody under the sun knows that's what they should have done. You still have to ask the question, why didn't you? Or if you had it to do over again, would you give the ball to Marshawn? People are gonna say, well, that's a stupid question. Of course they should have gotten it. They don't wanna hear you say it. You're the reporter, you're not the football coach. They wanna hear the coach's response. The coach may not wanna answer it, Coach may think it's a dumb question. You have to ask it anyway, because you, if, even if he doesn't answer it, you want to get the reaction to share, okay? It's like how many years ago was it that um, Jim Mora was coaching the Indianapolis Colts, and somebody asked him about, so what do you think, it was early in the season, I think they were two and five, two and six, something like that, and one of the, one of the reporters goes, so what do you think your chances are of making the playoffs? Because they've been predicted to be pretty good that year. What do you think your chances are of making the playoffs? And he goes into his, playoffs? Playoffs? You're talking about playoffs? Playoffs? Brilliant question. At two and five, the way they were playing, there was no chance they were making the playoffs. Got to ask that question anyway, just because you're predicted to be good. At two and five, you still got a chance. At two and six, you still got a chance. If they ride the ship, get things going, not likely, you've still got to ask that question so you get the response and it's one of the best responses ever in the history of the NFL, okay? So go ahead and ask those questions, all right? Um, yeah, so those are some tips about covering the event. Questions about that? Now you've covered the event, you've asked your questions, it is time to write your story. How many of you like writing game stories? That's your favorite thing when you're writing, is to report on the game. Mm -hmm. It's all right. It's all right. How many of you would prefer to do features? You'd rather write the feature, why? usually get more room to tell your story. Yeah. And print, we're changing here a little bit because of what? What's causing us to change the way we cover sports uh, as far as doing game stories? ESPN, yeah. ESPN the radio, yeah. things like that that are more instantaneous. You know, I watched the game, I saw what happened, so all you're going to give me is just a recap of what happened. I want some analysis. So I may watch ESPN that night and in about a minute and a half get the highlights of the big plays that happened during that game and I've been told the game story, but then I can hear the commentary, okay? Well, if television will allow us to do that or listening on the radio will allow us to do that and then listening to sports talk will allow us to listen to them talk about the game and what's coming next and some of those things, what's there left for print? Why do I need to write the game story? Quite frankly, we really don't. I mean, you can get more depth. 
you can give more information, you can print stats where people can see it and they can come back to it on their own time. Although that's changing now because of the internet, I can go online to ESPN.com and, and, and watch the highlights whenever I want to. We still cover it, but we're seeing a lot more done with feature stories, okay? A lot more with, with blogs and, com and uh, columns and things like that. But we still have to write the game story. And the things I'm talking about here as far as writing for the game story, a lot of it's transferable because in broadcast, we do have to cover the game. We do have to recap what's happening because people do want to see those big plays. They do want to see the highlights. Then we can get into the commentary. Get as much information as you can. Better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Worst feeling in the world is when your editor gives you 15 inches, you don't do enough research, ask enough questions, have enough data, and you can only write a 12 inch story. That's the worst, especially as a young reporter. When I was cutting my teeth with the Stelly Democrat, that happened to me one time. One time. And I had to milk and dig anything. It was a low scoring football game. There was not a whole lot happening. And it wasn't like the defense played great, it was just kind of a sloppy football game. And the coaches didn't want to say very much. <laughs> I got you 12 and I've given you every quote I've got. I've given you every stat I've got. I've given you everything I have. Get every bit of information you possibly can. Which means I'm seeing that it's a 10-6 football game. Like, yeah, I better start paying attention to how many turnovers there are, what the field conditions are, um, what kinds of plays are being made. Anything I can think of to dig up that information. Okay, talk to as many people as you can, double check your facts, double check your math, do all of that as you're getting ready to go, okay? Fans today want more sophisticated stats. How many of you like the new analytics in baseball that they're using? Some of them they're starting to do a little more in football. Do you like it? Sabermetrics. Sabermetrics, yes. Yeah. Which one do you like best? Uh, well, I Baseball's I doing it a lot more than anybody else. Baseball kind of sets the trend of what we do as far as stats. Well, I never, I still like struggle to understand the number of replacement coaches on the other ones, but like, I haven't really gotten the new stuff. But what's about replacement some of the ones that I like to look at? And I like the idea of it, but I still weird. Yeah, they're trying to figure out, okay, well, if you're fielding and you're batting, how many, how many hits you're going to get, how many runs you're going to drive in, what's your range for, how much ground can you cover so that ball dropped or would you have caught it? Yeah. It's, so like that's they, hard to really. They take like an average player and that's like zero. Especially when you have a negative war. <laughs> You're below the average player. <laughs> Crap, that stinks. <laughs> um, and they don't even have to be the, the saber metrics. It can be things like on base plus slugging percentage, OBP. Okay, because you want to look at how often they get on base and how hard they hit the ball. It gives you a better idea of the total player. But fans want to know more of those things. They want to know more about trends. Why are the Royals on a losing streak? What are they doing wrong? They're, they seem to be scoring runs. Their defense seems to be great. Yeah, but their starting pitching is terrible and they're wearing out their bullpen. Okay, so things like that. Um, what's coming up next? So you saw last week as the Royals put together a few wins. Now this week, they have three games against the White Sox, who are number one in the division. Then they have three games, I think, against Minnesota. I don't remember where Minnesota they have behind them. They're last. They're last. Okay. So they've got three games against them. Better win those games. And then they have four games against the White Sox. So here within a two-week span, they could go from really struggling to tops of the league or tops of the division. Okay. Fans want to know those types of things. So that's where you start giving them some of the analysis. We're going to cover the game for you, but then we're going to get into the impact. Things you need to think about uh, when you're writing a story, number one, have a quality lead. What is the purpose of the lead? To gain interest. Gain interest and? It's clear a lot of the uh, key information is needed. Provide some of the key information that's going into telling your story. What format, and we'll talk more about this here in a minute, but what format do you think we write most sports event stories in? What structure? Inverted pyramid. Why? all the important information first and then go broader because sometimes the reader stops reading. Yeah, readers are going to typically stop reading if they've got everything they need, especially nowadays. So we hit the most important information first and we funnel it down. There's two forms we typically use in sports. 
but when we're covering an event, that's the format we use in print. In broadcast, we do not. In broadcast, we want to build the drum. Okay. Um, talk about field conditions. If you got a turf, is that as important? Can be. It depends where you're, if you're away, if your team's away, they play on the grass and they play on the turf. I asked our baseball team whenever we got the new turf field, you know, they have, it's all turf, like where the dirt is, is brown turf. I didn't think the, the, for the players, the fielders, no big deal, but I wanted to know from the pitchers. I said, what do you think about it? I hate it. it sucks. I just spent millions of dollars to put you a turf and you're complaining about the mound. The whole field is turf. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything. It's pretty. It is. Well, the thing that they can do with a turf field, and this is again going to the field conditions, if you have a team that's built for speed, you put more sand down because they can get more of a grip and they go faster. If you've got a team that's built more for power, you want to slow the other team down, you don't put as much of that down. So it slows it down, slows the ball down. But the pitcher's coming off that mound, because you know, usually you'll see a pitcher up there and he's digging in by the rubber so he can have something to plant on. You do that when it's turf, you have nothing to dig into. They said that it gets really slick. I've had a couple of uh, players say that their shoes start to melt because it gets really hot when you're standing up there on that. So how do you adjust? I asked them, I said, do you think it gives you an advantage? Because when teams come in here, that have never played on that, you know how to adjust to that mound. They won't. And they said, well, actually, there's five other teams in the league that already have it. So it's not really giving them an advantage over them. Do you think it hurts you when you go play on a dirt mound? Not really, because we play on enough of those. A lot, Most of them will play summer ball, and they've played on dirt mounds their whole career. No, that's no big deal. But the teams that come in that, that don't play on turf gives them a little bit of an advantage. So how are the field conditions, whether it's turf or not? Teams used to, if they were a team built for speed, they would cut their grass really short, and then they were faster. Teams that were slower would keep the grass higher. Which I always thought, well, doesn't that make you slower? Slower than more. Well, if you're used to it, you know. So, um, think about organization and what, how you're going to organize and structure your story. Think about the context and the analysis again, as we've talked about some of the key plays. Obviously, stat. One thing that we're hearing a lot of people say now is don't get really stat heavy because there are so many statistics now. It's almost uh, overuse of statistics is almost coming cliche. You generally will put statistics like who's the top passer, who is the top rusher, who had the most tackles. Where do you think that will go? If we're saying don't go crazy on stats, where do you think that will go? Closer to the end, because again, in an inverted pyramid, if I have to cut information, I can cut there. I can cut some of that, so we don't go crazy on the stats, all right? You want great quotes. I hate reading a sports story where they didn't quote anybody. That drives me crazy. So get some good quotes. The language, know the language of the sport. Know what you're talking about. And then, of course, the type of the story is going to affect your structure. Quality lead, it's not necessarily the winner or the loser that you want to talk about in the lead. It may be the impact it had on the game. It may be a top performance. You know, you may have a pitcher who threw a perfect, or I'm sorry, threw a no-hitter and still lost. My 10-year-old son's a big baseball and soccer player, so he's asking me, I mean, it's just, he'll be a wonderful reporter someday, because it's just question after question after question after question. And he said, so Dad, you couldn't lose a game if you had a perfect game, right? I'm like, right, the other team never gets on. He goes, so what about a no-hitter? I'm like, yeah, that's happened. How? So then I have to explain, well, they can still walk. There can still be an error. You can lose a game one to nothing because you walked them and then somebody threw the ball away and they got a three-base error and they scored a run and you lost. Well, that would stink. Yes, it would. <laughs> okay, so talk about those types of things. Uh, we talked about field conditions already. I think I can skip through a lot of this because we just talked a lot about it. Um, again, context and analysis, fans want to know what is the impact of this game? What is the impact of what that player just did? Maybe you had a player who broke a record, became the all-time leading rusher. They still didn't win, okay? We want to talk about that. We want to talk about those key plays, and remember, key plays aren't necessarily scoring plays. They may be a play that kept a drive alive. They may be a big penalty. 
what was it, the game last year, the Saints, was it, no, not the Saints, it was the Packers and Seattle, who they were playing. Whenever they, uh, it was fourth down, it was the end of the game, Aaron Rodgers drops back to pass, incomplete pass. They call, it wasn't pass interference, it was face mask. They called it a defensive face mask, and a football game can't end on a defensive penalty. They called a face yeah. mask because the, the defensive end reached out to get Aaron Rodgers and hit his face, and they called a 15-yard penalty. Packers got another play. He launches the ball, and they score a touchdown, and they win the ball game. So the key play wasn't that pass. It was the play that happened before it, the defensive penalty, and the discussion was, is that really a penalty or not? I mean, never grabbed his face mask. Well, you can't like, touch their face either. So yeah, it's still a penalty. Like, but in that situation, do you call that play? That's like the other week whenever uh, Russell Westbrook traveled on the end of the game, and it was a loss, I guess. I mean, it's never going to come down to one play that could have been a loss. It's not. It's never going to be one play, but it's still, as a reporter, it's that one play that we have to look at that changed the way it was to change the game. The field goal kicker that misses the field goal, but he had the distance if they hadn't gotten that delay of game penalty. It's the delay of game penalty that, which you don't know. I mean, if you're five yards closer, maybe he doesn't hit it as hard, or maybe he shanks it. You never know, but what led to that? So those are things to keep in mind. This one was really, the, the one I pointed up up here, one of my redeeming moments as a sports information director, we were playing Truman. They lost by one point. They had a player that I knew. I was keeping stats. I could see his feet. He hit a three-pointer. But I can't give him a three-pointer unless the referee hit. throws his arms up. Okay? So I gave him a two. Their crowd, and the scoreboard went up. They gave him a two. Their crowd was all over me. I'm not keeping the scoreboard. I'm not the official. I'm just keeping the stats. They were all over me. And then after the game, they caught me out in the hallway and started molesting me that, their, their player hit a three and we cheated them. I was like, they never signaled a three. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. I was, I couldn't sleep that night. I was like, if we could screw that kid out of a three-pointer and we won that game on that. I went in the next day. Our assistant AD said, come on, Joe, we're going to go down to the to Coach Anderson's office. I want you to see this video. And that's all he said. I was like, oh, crap. So we walked down there and he, they already keyed it up. He goes, you're vindicated. Played it. Kid was a foot behind the three point line. Not one of the three officials raised his arms. I had to give him a two. Our scoreboard operator had to give him a two. Those are the kinds of plays that, as a reporter, I look at that and go, he clearly had a two. Everybody thought he had a two. The officials didn't give it, and there are the official scores. This was before the days of having the replay. So, those are the types of things to watch for. They make the story more interesting. Again, as sports reporters, as sports writers covering events, as we start seeing that pushed aside, we have to think of other ways. Now, what could we tell them? How can we report and give them more information? Okay. Again, with stats, um, don't get carried away. They're important, but we don't want to just vomit stats onto our audience. So watch for that. Use the vivid language and the active verbs. Again, too much adjective and adverb usage takes up space. We have to avoid that at all costs. All right? We need to use more. The center swatted the ball into the fifth row, not uh, the swatter blocked the ball with a vengeance or made a massive block or things like that. That way, we can get more words in there. It's more active. It's more engaging. Two structures that we talked about mostly when we talked sports reporting are the inverted pyramid and the diamond structure. We've talked a lot about the inverted pyramid. Does everybody understand what the inverted pyramid is? Lead comes down to the least important information. So you give your lead, you're probably in the next paragraph if you didn't give the score or the result, they, in the first paragraph you're gonna give it in the second. You kind of get into chronological order of what happened during the game, and then you come to your conclusion, okay? If it was a really tight game, a really exciting finish, you might give that up toward the top because you don't want that to get cut out and then work your way down into chronological, okay? But you're gonna go in that order, all right? The diamond structure is like the inverted pyramid with a couple of differences, okay? Diamond structure, one noticeable strength, it builds the drama. So in the diamond structure, 
you're like a diamond. Give your lead, go to the immediate past, then you jump to the distant past, then you get into your chronological order. It looks like that. You lead the thing of your story, you get into the body, you come to your end. Okay. When would you think you would want to use the diamond structure? Hmm? Feature story. Broadcast is a good time to use diamond structure. If you're using, the, using the inverted pyramid, if you're working for a daily newspaper because you're coming out every single day, you've got to get to it quickly. Um, it was about a game that happened really recently. You don't have a lot of space because you can cut if you have to. No historical nature. Um, it's more, more news oriented type stories. This is actually what happened or this is what's going to happen if you're in, uh, announcing an event that's coming up, that sort of thing. Diamond structure works well for a magazine because they're longer. Those articles are much longer. Or for broadcast. Um, not necessarily for a game story. It could be for a profile or any type of feature. Um, if you have some historical context, it's like if you're talking about a rivalry, maybe an advanced story that you might write, and you're going to be talking about a rivalry leading into the game. Okay. Uh, space isn't a factor, so you can write for more. You have more space to write it online. It would work because of that. Although we don't want to write so long in an online story that they have to continue scrolling. What is it like three clicks or three scrolls through, and people are done? So you have to watch for that. Okay. So as you're writing your event story, the assignments you've got coming up. As you're writing that event story, which which format are you going to be writing in? Inverted pyramid. Use the inverted pyramid. Okay, I've given you all the information. I've given you quotes. I've given you some. I've given you the box scores. I've given you some of the key notes from that game. Think about what you want to use in it and write in that inverted pyramid format. Okay. Okay. Let's take a quick break. We come back. We'll talk about cross country and soccer, and uh, we'll cover the the assignment for this next week. All right, as far as covering the event, those of you who haven't started, those of you who have, if you had any issues with, with it or anything you didn't understand, um, you can take care of that now. This is what you're going to be doing a lot of, is covering events, whether that is for broadcast or for print, so I want you to get some experience doing it. However, for a summer class, there's not a whole lot going on in the summer for you to be able to go out and cover. I've seen that in the past that the hardest thing with this is how to get out there and cover anything. You don't have time to develop rapport with anybody, so because it's an introductory class, I just got some information for you, okay? Um, the, the information I got comes from our textbook. It's at the back of your text, so if you want to look back there at that, it's there as well, but I thought for your convenience I would just type it all up. Page and a half to two pages for the story. Do not do not, do not put Matthew Vaughn, sports reporting, summer 2016, Dr. Joe Moore, and the date, and take up half your page. I want your name, sports reporting, or your name and event story, and then get into your story, okay? I want a full page, page and a half, double spaced, 12 inch type, 12 inch times New Roman, one inch margins. You will email it to me, okay? Any of the assignments you do here, you'll email to me. If it's too big of a file, like when you do your highlights or what have you, that's gonna sh it's gonna kick you to load it up on Google Drive, which is fine, and then just share it with me. Okay, it'll automatically put it on Google Drive and share it with me. That way I can get it. All right, but you don't have to go to Dropbox. There's no assignment pad in Blackboard for it. Just email these assignments. Okay. Um, I've given you a rubric. So you can see what I'm going to be looking for. I want to make sure that you're following the proper assignment, that this is your event story, that you didn't write it like an advance, that you didn't write it like a column or anything like that. I want a good lead that's going to grab my attention, that you hit the major, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. You hit the major ones of those. What do you think is the most important question in an event story of the who, what, when, where, why, and how? Who? What's the second most? What? What? Who and what are the two critical questions? 
okay? So make sure you grab those first. You do it here to good AP style and good grammar. That's why the Writing Cross Media class is a prereq for this one. That's why I say you can give me a rough draft by Thursday if you want me to take a look at it so I can make some comment. Makes it a lot easier for me to grade anyway. Gets you a better score. I know it may seem, AP style may seem stupid and petty, but it's what allows us when we go from one newspaper in Warrensburg to Sedalia to Kansas City to Wichita to Denver. It's a consistency. It's a language that we speak in. Okay, so if we can read that and not have to question, what are they saying here? A lot of AP style is written because it condenses space. So we have more room, all right? So get to know, okay? At least get to know where the rules are that you may not remember so you know where you, what you need to go look up. I still do that today, all right? Um, I want to see that you get demonstrated good organization, that you follow that, that uh, inverted pyramid, that you've got your most important information up front and that you're building to it. I want to see that you've done good good job getting quotes and using appropriate quotes. Those quotes that are given there, you don't have to use the whole quote. You don't have to use every quote that's there and you don't have to use the whole quote. If you thought part of it was kind of lame, don't use it. That's one of the worst things you can do is take a quote that really means nothing and plug it in, okay? You don't have to use the, the box there that has the information from the game, the notes. You don't have to use all those notes, okay? Use the key stuff. And then you can see that option one is to do the football game. It was a Class 3A Florida State High School football game at Citrus Bowl in Orlando, Florida. It happened this evening. Why is this relevant? You're writing for tomorrow's paper. Helps you know the date when it was done, okay? When it comes to dates, if it happened this year, you do not need to write 2016. So if you give it a date, it's just, what is the date? The 20, 23rd? May 23rd or May 23, as you would write in print. Okay. That's why that's in there. But you've got notes, you've got quotes, you have the score by quarter, you have a scoring summary, team stats, player stats, play-by-play -play for overtime. Why do you think in this case we didn't give the whole play-by-play? Nothing major happened. There would have been notes. I mean, like we talked about, the, goal, the field goal kicker missed four field goals. There were four interceptions. There were four interceptions, but is that really critical to know exactly when those things took place? So, okay. The basketball game would give you the play-by-play, -play, plus the fact that play-by-play -play for football would go on page after page after page after, and I won't type on that. Um, neither did Jasani. Uh, the basketball game, same sort of thing. You do get play-by-play, -play. I just scanned it as I wasn't about to retype all that. You do get the play-by-play -play for this whole game, okay? I um, want to give you one note. Oh, oh, never mind. Okay, that is due Thursday. Give me a rough draft by, or I'm sorry, due Sunday by midnight. If you want me to look at a rough draft, give me a rough draft by Thursday. I'll take a look at it, make some comments, and send it back to you. 